Welcome to the Gospel Coalition podcast, equipping the next generation of believers, pastors, and church leaders to shape life and ministry around the gospel. Today, we bring you a panel discussion on discipling college students for the long haul. This workshop was originally held at TGC's 2018 Women's Conference. Well, again, thank you for coming out. Um, My name is Danielle Saladay, and I have the privilege of moderating this panel. I'm excited for all of you to hear from the women up here with me. Um, We're going to very quickly introduce ourselves, our bios. We know you have our bios, so we won't repeat all of it, Um, but we want to just begin our time by telling you the context in which we are serving and then also, very briefly, our our heart for college students. Um, Before we do that, it would help us to know a little bit about some of you. Um, Can I just ask quickly, um, how many of you are in campus ministry? Would you raise your hand? Okay, great. How many of you serve at churches where there are a lot of college students who come? Wonderful. How many of you are parents of college students? (laughs) How many of you are college students? Great. Okay, wonderful. Um, Well, I know if you're here, you love, sorry? Teachers. Teachers. Oh, yes, professors. I should have thought of that. Right here, anybody else? Oh, fabulous. Okay, sorry. Thank you. (laughs) Um, Yes, well, thank you. I know you're here because you love students, so hopefully we will um, encourage one another in loving them well. Um, Again, my name is Danielle. I work at Princeton University. I've been in campus ministry there for 20 years now, um, and I work Uh, with students, discipling them through Bible studies, through one-on-one mentoring times called personal hours, through many large group interactions. Um, I have a particular heart for college-age students because I myself grew so much. It was a pivotal time in my life where I was blessed with wonderful leaders who really impacted me. And so as I moved on into life and was choosing uh, what to do, what a privilege I thought it would be to pour back into college students myself. Um, So that's just a little about me, and I'm thrilled to share with you more as we go. Um, Let me hand it to Amy. My name is Amy Joseph, and my husband and I work with college students on the West Coast in San Diego, California. So we, our role has shifted over the years from more student-facing to a little bit more staff development-facing, but we have college students in in and out of our home probably three nights a week. So we're still around the college students a lot. Um, And I, similar story in the sense of, I was not raised in a Christian home and came to faith through Young Life at the very end of high school, but knew nothing, knew nothing about anything, um, and grew to love God's word, um, was trained in evangelism and discipleship all through college ministries. And so as soon as that happened, I was like, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. Hi, guys. My name is Corey Porter. I'm originally from Oxford, Mississippi. And when I was at the University of Mississippi, right before my freshman year, two campus ministers gave me the gospel. So it totally transformed the trajectory of my life. So with that in mind, when I start to go to seminary and I start to think about job opportunities, I was like, what is my first love? And it's college students, right? And so God gave me the opportunity to work at um, a couple of churches. And then now I'm at a parachurch ministry that works at Princeton University with um, separate of Danielle, but in the same space with Danielle. Yeah. My name is Shar Walker, and I also serve on staff at Campus Outreach, but on the East Coast, so complete opposite end of the country, um, in Lynchburg, Virginia. So I became a Christian my freshman year of college, and I, honestly, that probably is where the heart for college students began, because similarly, it was, I think, probably one of the most pivotal times in my life, not just in terms of redemption, but definitely in being developed and established in the faith and um, just saw godly examples of different women and who were single, who were married across the board. So yeah, I love, love, love college students. I love the energy and the excitement that they bring to pretty much everything. So (laughs) yes, for me, they keep me young. (laughs) Um, So we have prepared some questions just based on our shared expertise. Um, I'll ask those questions first of the panel, and I'll watch the time, and then after a few moments, we'll open it up for questions from from you all. So make sure there's plenty of time for that, okay? Um, So first question is for Shar, Um, and here it is. What does intentional discipleship look like in your ministry? And what would you say are the key components 
and why are they essential for this age group, for college students? Yeah, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the phrase um, in terms of teaching that things are caught, not taught. Um, but I think sometimes with discipleship for me, it's both and. Things have been both caught and taught. So there's an element of my discipleship that has been more like taking your students along with you and inviting them into your life and even simple things like taking a student to go to the grocery store with you or to cook a meal. Um, I had one student, she's she's a Christian now and walking with the Lord, but I remember we built a relationship because we saw a movie at the Dollar Theater pretty much every weekend for months on end and we developed a friendship, but... There are elements of discipleship that I think are just the nature of walking and sharing life together. And then there's also the element of it that's like more intentional and um, more thoughtful. And I think that's the parts that are more taught. And those are the seasons where there are some weeks I, or usually I would meet with students one-on-one -on -one every week in a more formal sense. And we're going through some element of content, studying the Bible, praying. Um, many of the students I was discipling they just became Christians during college. So I feel like my discipleship has mostly been very foundational things of the faith. Why is community essential? How do you share the gospel? Um, those kind of things, reading your Bible, praying, et cetera. So that's, those have been kind of my experience for discipleship. I don't know if you guys would add or... Is that a question again? Oh, sure. Just what are the, what are the key elements of discipleship? Yeah, I think I'm with Ashar. I didn't understand that discipleship was twofold. When I came to faith, like I said, two ministers gave me the gospel. They were actually men. And so because of that dynamic of gender, I was more taught in the word than I was life on life. And so when I became a campus minister, I was like, I take a girl where? I do what with her? I didn't know I didn't know how to interact with her in a personal, informal way, right? And if you're really going to invest with someone and really build their heart with the scripture, you have to invest in their life also. And so for me, it was a real conviction when as I read scripture and Paul says, I loved you so much, I gave my very life to you. And so for me in discipleship, it is twofold, like you said, Char. So I definitely back what she's saying. Mm -hmm. Um, Amy, um, we know that a lot of discipleship involves building relationships, making space for women to be known. How do you balance teaching God's word with listening and speaking into the life, the issues your women bring up for counsel? And getting practical, how do you structure the time that you have for your discipleship meetings? Yeah, I don't know if you've had this experience, but when you get a group of small group of women in the room together, there's a pull towards the subjective. And that's not wrong. I think initially I, I, I'm such an objective. I love truth. I love the word. Um, I tended to kind of overvalue maybe the objective and kind of, oh, that's just fluff with the subjective. But it's a, it's a balance of the both, content and context, right? Subjective and objective, that there is an experiential element, especially with the younger generations, right? Being seen and being heard. Um, but one of the things that I do just structurally is at the beginning of our, um, of our groups, I usually have us pray through confession or, or pray through adoration or pray through the names of Jesus or the, the different life stages of Jesus or whatever to kind of say from the beginning, hey, this is ultimately about him. And, um, and sometimes we connect with each other rather than just sharing, which there's a time for that. But sometimes we'll intentionally say, we're not connecting today. We're going to connect directly with the Lord and we're going to connect with each other through that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be very caught up on each other when we confess our sins, <laughs> right? And, and we're, we're also going to talk about the silly stuff, right? We're going to do that. That's important. So I think that's significant. And then I think I said this last night on our one-to-one -one discipleship panel, but I think the, the always having opening the word with them is really significant because I think otherwise there's a pull towards relying on self, personality, experience, wisdom, their self, their personality, their experience, their wisdom, um, rather than the scriptures. And so it's a both and, it's not an either or, but I think one has to have priority. And so that they know that this is what this is about ultimately. Um, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a part of it. It's not about me. It's about him, but it involves me and it includes my story. So I think that and then the storyline stuff has been very helpful in our discipleship towards that end of um, he is the hero. He's the main, he's the main character of this story. Uh, your, your part is significant, but it's not about you, my friend, um, especially in the younger generation. So. Yeah, I think another practical, so when I'm sitting down with a student and we're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, what do I start with? 
how do I even talk with her about God, how we get there? I think it depends on her maturity level, to be honest, how you enter into the conversation. To your point, it needs to be rooted in scripture. It needs to be rooted in the wisdom of God, first and foremost. Um, I'm a little fundamentalist about this. I don't use a lot of secondary literature, to be honest. I actually open the text because our voice, how powerful it is at that young age, and that's great that we get to form them, but you have to be careful because eventually your voice will become mute. Whatever stage of life to get into, whatever circumstances they have, they won't have access to you 24 seven, but they will to God's word. And if they haven't learned to trust it with your care and your guidance, you can become a situation where you're a mini God in their life. So for me, I'm definitely with you with opening the scripture and getting them to understand that God's word is what gives them life and breathes them to them. But I also look at three ways in which I actually approach them. So they're kind of categories, the soul, what is going on within your soul? What are you wrestling with right now? The depths of with you and God. Is it a family issue where you don't understand how he's right and he's good in that issue? Another thing I do is the body. Now, this comes into how you're caring for yourself and health. We're at Princeton, and students take their body to the limit, and they have several consequences before that. So I'm always asking, how are you eating? How are you feeling today? Um, what, what, it, what stress level do you feel like you have? And because stress levels also open up our, the students up to more and more sin levels, right? And so if you're stressed here, then your body may naturally want immediate gratification. And so you're, you'll see your levels of pornography watching go up or you see masturbation go up, or you see um, anorexia go up because the girl is so overwhelmed because she's not caring for her soul. And then lastly, our students are academics. And so I never create this dichotomy. I've heard it once that you are, you're a Christian first and a student second. And I just think that's just, that's horrible advice. God has given these women four years to educate themselves, and they should be able to do that with excellence. So how do you take your study seriously as you glorify Christ? So those are the three areas. I go, again, I go um, soul, body, and I go mind. And I'm trying to get them, and they don't know that I'm using this formula, and I may bounce around to different areas, but I'm always keeping track. So next time I follow up with them, we can actually have somewhere that I'm going. I know, what did she say about her soul last time? What did she say about her mind? Yeah, I would say additionally, for the Bible study context, a really good practical, especially if the girls don't know one another, is to have, like, and they're all believers, is to have each week maybe one person share their testimony, mm -hmm. like how they came to faith. So you're just over, built into the structure of the Bible study. You're creating a context for them to get to know one another and for you to get to know them as well. In the one-on-one, -on -one, I feel like I do similar things. Someone... I don't know who coined this term, maybe someone in CO, but they called it the power hour. And they structured their one-on-one -on -one times with students to be the first 20 minutes is kind of that like shepherding or care for them. The next 20 minutes is time in God's word. And the last 20 minutes are spent like prayer and supplication or adoration, any of those elements of prayer. But it just kind of gives you a little bit of a structure to go in with. Although then there are times where you have this great thing planned out you're going to talk about and a student is like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. the Holy Spirit just kind of changes your plans right there. So, you know, we hold them loosely, in other words. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, that, that leads to this next question about um, biblical literacy, particularly among students today. Um, all of the social metrics out there are telling us that biblical literacy is always decreasing and it's particularly low right now with current generations of students. So how are we communicating the importance of God's word, of knowing it, of, of believing it, of applying it to our lives? How are you all doing that? Uh, I'll direct this first toward, um, wait, sorry, Char, this was for you. You prepared this, but then we'll all jump in. Yeah, I think um, this goes definitely for more Bible studies that are with believers, but I'm going to gear it a little bit more to evangelistic type of Bible studies because a lot of the students that at least the campus I was at were, are from, this is an observation, often the ones from the northern part of the country have a little less biblical like um, literacy or context for scripture. So I'm this past year, my evangelistic Bible studies were like dummy proof. I'm not kidding. Like I made them, they were 25 minutes tops. Sometimes they were 20 minutes. And I would tell the girls, Hey guys, like I would love to invite you into investigating what the scriptures have to do at your life. Would you commit to doing this for four weeks for 20 minutes? And I tell them, cause they're not believers. I'm like, you don't have to change anything about your life right now. Cause I think that's one of the biggest fears. And in this time, what I'm trying to do in a lot of ways is a lot of them feel like, how does the Bible relate to me? Like, is this relevant? 
And I want to create a context that shows them this is how God's word is relevant to your life. We typically look at one passage or like one scripture and we'll have one main point. So that's why I say it's very simple, very accessible, but you have them in God's word. I'm just trying not to like overload them with it. And also making it engaging is helpful where it's a bit more of a conversation versus a sermon net or a monologue to them about it. So that's, those are a few of things, especially in just more of the evangelistic type of context. Cause I feel like those might be a little bit different than Bible studies. But. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. That's really good. I didn't think about, I think sometimes I have these high expectations and goals that are lofty that sometimes I, I personally feel a little bit, um, not okay with lowering my expectations, but to your point, it's allowing them to be able to actually consume. Yeah. You know, whereas if we, I think we put the lofty goal too high, we're not actually ministering to the people that God has called us to. Uh, for me, I feel like what I had to do was understand the redemptive narrative myself before I tried to teach little sections of the Bible in systematic ways. And so the easiest way women to do this, I'm gonna be very honest, is to t- take a children's Bible and read through it. Just take the children's Bible and read through it. You get a grand narrative of the gospel from Genesis to Revelation. So when you're in Romans and he makes a call from the Old Testament about Abraham, you may not know all the stories of Abraham, but you remember, oh, he was the husband of Sarah. Oh, yeah, he did have a son, Isaac, right? And so it connects dots for you just in a really touch point way. And I get my students involved in the grand narrative. So once they understand the big picture, right, you kind of give it to them as a movie or a plot or some type of story, they're able to more make connection dots to it. And so they're not lost in the text or not really knowing what's going on. The last thing that I um, do is also I try to make sure they understand. Um, there's two translations when you read uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. One is, it's God breathed and one is it God inspired. And the actual right translation is that, that God's word is God's breath. And when the students actually realize that this is the actual voice of God speaking to them, you guys, they are in awe because they start to anticipate him speaking to them in the text. So I think it's actually seen it not as this ancient, antiquated data of books, but actually the living word actually coming to them and helping them with their understanding this world and to getting relief and to knowing Christ more sweeter. Yeah, and I would echo the redemptive narrative, the whole meta narrative. Um, a, A good book, I think... You maybe have read it, but God's Big Picture by, by Vaughn Roberts is great in that it goes through the, the theme of kingdom and just kind of gives you an overarching structure. And especially in San Diego, we're dealing with students who have, in fact, funny story, we, my husband was sharing with when we first moved to San Diego, and he was like, I'm not going to get the bookends wrong. I'm going to start, can't start at sin. i got to start at creation, right? And so he's talking about Adam and Adam, and the guy stops and is like, who's Adam? Is Adam your friend? Is Adam your staff guy? And he's like... How do you do this out here? How do you share the gospel when they don't even know who Adam is? They don't even know what Genesis is. And so the, the meta narrative thing has been huge for us of the of synthesis is significant. So synthesis, the big picture, what's the whole of the thing? And then and then exegesis. So they have a concept. So they, they have an eye down towards the scripture and then an eye up towards why is this important that we're studying the book of Ephesians? Why are we digging into this? Um, and then I think not avoiding the Old Testament is significant. Once you get that, and you can't do that with a freshmen at San Diego State, but you can do that when they've walked with God for a few years of helping them see um, Jesus in the Old Testament. So the Jesus Storybook Bible is great, especially for non-believers, because it's just that, you know, he is the hero, he's the... And then we try to teach our students through the lens of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, the four-chapter gospel, and I think that helps baby steps towards a Christian worldview. Um, Okay, so gender confusion in our culture. Let's talk about that. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. How did God intend the world to be? And so I just think giving them a paradigm like that is a helpful beginning place for biblical literacy. Yes, we, um, we definitely have a different approach depending on if it's a seeker or someone who's coming with a strong background already. Um, but, you know, we go into this discipleship w- w- with a program in mind of uh, what would happen if we had a student for four years. Hmm. Um, and so in the Bible studies, so every, every student, um, if they're fully participating, would be in a class Bible study by gender um, with a leader. And then that leader would also offer to meet with each person in the Bible study one-on-one for that mentoring time throughout the week. And the Bible studies, um, for the freshmen, it's um, looking at a gospel. 
Who is Jesus and what did he do? So studying a gospel for the entire year. Sophomore year is the drama of redemption from Genesis to Revelation, giving the big picture of the whole Bible from beginning to end. Junior year is the book of Ephesians, call, God's call that we, are, uh, we belong to him in Christ, but we also belong to a new people. We're part of a people, the church. What does that mean? What is our life to look like in community with others? And then senior year, um, an emphasis on uh, God's heart for, for social concern from the Old Testament, looking at all kinds of topics uh, like money, justice, um, and uh, roles of men and women, and also things preparing them for beyond graduation, um, everything from relationships to work to giving to how to find a church, how to be in a church. Um, and in that one-on-one -on -one time, uh, we use the Book of Romans. So Shar's uh, description of 202020, with plenty of time for personal interaction and life counsel, also week by week going through the Book of Romans and connecting it to whatever is going on in their lives. Sometimes there's no direct connection, but so often whatever we're studying in the Book of Romans, the student is realizing, oh yes, this is speaking to what I'm going through right now. Um, so uh, that's just a snapshot of like a, an idea of a program of how to uh, build in biblical literacy uh, to our students right now. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit and ask my colleagues, um, a question about current college students. Um, so I'll direct this toward Corey, but all of us can jump in. Um, how would you characterize the current generation of college students? What do they get easily about the gospel? What is challenging for them? So Corey, yeah, start us that's off. A, that's a lofty question. Yeah. Wow. I guess, I mean, the current college student would be categorized as a millennial. And so I think oftentimes when you see millennial, 18, um, I think it's 18, actually a 34. So many of us are fit in that uh, category up here. But 18 to 21 is who we're probably ministering to. I feel like they're social change agents. They naturally get advocacy. They naturally are inspirational. They want to make a difference in this world. But the, the sad thing about that is, is that they are the most unchurched generation. And so while they have this inner calling to actually do something and make the world a better place, they have no guidance into how to do that. They have no authority, no ultimate voice telling them this is right and good. So everybody's left up to their own devices to figure out how they feel the world should look. If social, um, sexual ethics, dealing with race, dealing with different um, money topics and so, um, social discrimination. So just depending on where the student is or what the student upbringing is, um, actually surfaces what their rally cry is. And so that's unfortunate because what they get about the gospel is that even if they're church or unchurched, I think they do get that Jesus loves or Jesus saves right? But the reason why that is somewhat cheapened is because they don't understand the holiness of God and that there's a holy God who has a holy reverence about himself. And there is no way on this earth to be reconciled with, with him without a costly price. And because they, the students don't get that, they scream Jesus all the time or they say, oh, Jesus is good. And they're willing to identify themselves with him, but they're not actually making Jesus the Lord over their life and in their decisions. And so to me, it becomes a lot about self-promotion or a lot about what I think is right in this time. And no matter what, your understanding or background is you have 18 years of life. So, I mean, you, do, you don't have your eternal perspective given to you by the wisdom, the wise counsel of God. You're going to make fo um, folly decisions. So to me, a current college student gets that the gospel is something that is good in, in some way, but they don't actually get or understand how to actually utilize it, make it a part of their life, make it a part of the ideology that they actually walk in, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was, what's like beautiful about college students is they do oftentimes have this zeal. I think the element of the social aspect that kind of seems to be in the DNA of a lot of college students today is there probably in generations in the past that that might have been absent in a care for the marginalized, a care for the oppressed. Those are like very admirable things. And, you know, in the same time, more in the same vein, I mean, more of a generational thing with um, millennials, I think sometimes there can be a difficulty committing to one thing, which I think could easily transfer into your faith, um, like being committed to your faith. And there can almost be, it's, I think, in the social media age and all that stuff, there can almost be a lessening of just the slow, steady faithfulness every day of walking with Jesus. And not these grandeur, like, I went to 
like, I can't think of, yeah, like you did all these amazing things for the Lord. When I'm like, I think honestly, just waking up in the morning, walking with Jesus, working your job faithfully and taking care of your family, that's very honoring to the Lord. Do you know, you know what I mean? So that's what I was going to say. I think that the flash and the experience are, are great draws initially. And they are. But if you're coming to Christ because of a flash and a draw and an experience, that's not going to send you to hard places to lay down your life. And that's not going to send you through cancer. And so I think a lack of the theology of suffering is really high in our people. And entitlement is really high. There's also, I mean, I'm just saying the hard things, but there's also beautiful things. But I think one of the things that I try to press in, and because I'm a mom, it's easier to do, is a long obedience in the same direction. This is how we walk with God day in and day out, and it's not always flashy. So I think an intimacy with God that goes beyond information is significant because they're so experiential. They get that, but um, the connecting the disciplines to, to experience, that we experience God through the disciplines because they only want to, and we talk a lot about duty, desire, and delight, that they, if they don't feel delight, they will go straight to disobedience. And so creating a grid again, because that was our, because maybe the generations before us, so focused on duty, right, that our culture has overswung so far to only if I feel it, is it real? And so recreating that structure around it that says, sometimes we want to want to, sometimes we love God's word, and sometimes we do it because it's what we do. And they, they feed into each other, but you cannot just jump from, delight to disobedience. There's this space for duty. And I think showing them kind of the, the liturgy of the ordinary and inviting them into how do we see a God-breathed universe, right? Like God is here and he's in this and he cares about this. And so, yeah, I, long obedience in the same direction. is. All of you mentioned um, a passion for social change, um, an identification with the marginalized. So these would be really praiseworthy things. Um, it's really exciting to be able to say, look at these Old Testament passages in the prophets. Do you see that our God actually feels the same way you do about social change and social justice? Um, so those are two good things you mentioned. Um, can you think of anything else that you would say is beautiful or, or praiseworthy that you would mention of this generation of college students? I think authenticity, mm-hmm. almost to a fault, but, um, but they, are, they are not afraid to be broken. Um, and I think because the... And, and a, a quick draw to the broken and the beautiful. Um, and I think that they're qu- much quicker to admit their brokenness and their need. Um, and I think they understand maybe m- because of the, the Tim Keller kind of sweet through the church, but um, I think they're beginning to understand sin is more than things we do, but really the idols of our heart. So I think they're really good at, at, those, at those things. Yeah, I would say, especially for a lot of the... Um, students I know who have come, become believers in college who didn't grow up in a Christian home, they, when they do come to faith, there is a beautiful excitement about God's word, about who he is. Like it really, it's amazing to see someone go from spiritual death to spiritual life because they actually look like they're spiritually alive now. And, um, one of the greatest privileges for me is getting to see the Lord vibrantly change students' lives. And he does it, the college campus, just because it feels a little more sped up, it happens kind of quickly versus like maybe when you get out of college and you're probably ministering a little bit more in the local church. But I think there is a sense of, I like that students are often excited about their faith. Not all the time, but it honestly, when they are, it spurs me on to want to wanna be that way too. Um, okay, so I'll direct this one towards um, Shar, but then, of course, everyone can jump in. Um, what do you believe are the biggest mistakes current students are making with technology and social media? But on the flip side, where do you see it being used for good? And how do you advise students? Yeah, I could hear by the giggles that uh, <laughs> this is obviously a good question. Um, yeah, I mean... I'll go on the record of saying I really like social media and I really like technology. So I'm not a basher by any means of the form itself. Um, But I would say this as a caution to college students and probably everyone else as well. But just because social media and technology are amoral does not mean they're powerless. And I think that is, I was talking to Melissa Kruger. um, We were flying back from a thing in Colorado And she was saying her generation, she has kids in high school, I think even about to go to college, her generation, she was like, we really didn't know a lot of the effects of the social media and the cell phone and all that because it was just kind of happening. 
Our generation does not have that excuse. We cannot plead ignorance. And I think my biggest fear with students is that we would educate and learn the effects of it, but completely ignore that. And just go, we just don't put up, I guess my caution would be, don't be foolish to not put up appropriate boundaries, especially with social media, and to guard your heart and your walk with the Lord as it relates to that specifically. Because even when we think, oh, it doesn't affect me. Like it's one, I just spent two hours scrolling on Instagram. Like it's no big deal. I do think those things actually do affect our soul. Um, Maybe even more than we realize at the time. So I would just say, use it to God's glory. Be cautious as we use it. I've used it to meet students. Like if I'm meeting a student and I can't particularly remember what they look like, it's been a great like way to remind myself, okay, this is what they look like. This is where they're from, like those kind of things. So I've seen it used positively and for God's glory. Um, But again, I just, I feel like appropriate boundaries might need to be set in place to protect ourselves spiritually. Even there's so much that could be said on this topic. I mean, I think one, one way I like social media is one of the hard things for me about college ministry is turnover. We disciple and we pour into these women and we love them. And then they go off, which is part of why college ministry is so strategic, right? They're going to be influencers um, and gospel pace setters in the nursing world and in the teaching world and overseas. And But it's really hard to keep up with them. So I have loved that it gives a, a casual, there's a depth to our relationship. But I don't get to see these people. I haven't seen most of them in five, six, seven, eight years. Um, so I, I love that in the sense of... Um, kind of harnessing continued relational networks and keeping up with people. But I agree, boundaries are key, are huge. And I think boundaries start external before they move internal, and they feel rigid before they feel natural. And so, um, yeah, I don't know exactly how to play that out. I mean, I know what we do with our children, but I don't know how, how maybe practicals of how that would play out on the campus. That's good. I, I definitely see the positive of social media. I personally abstain from social media just because it feels a bit overwhelming to always be connected. I'm a strong introvert, so I need my downtime to be away a little bit. To, so it's to constantly be stimulated it does feel a little bit overwhelming. But the positive effects I've seen in social media is that you can use it, like you said, to connect across um, time and space. Um, I went to Cambodia, I think, five, seven, no, seven years uh, ago for mission trips for women in sex trafficking. I'm still able to keep up with that same ministry. I know what's going on. I'm abreast of what's going on in their country or whatever is going on with that ministry because I'm able to see on Facebook and we're able to connect. Um, so that's a beautiful, really beautiful way to be able to use it toward the kingdom. For college students, what I've noticed though, that it does two things, particularly with my college student, is that it allows them to have an excuse not to be in godly community. It allows them to be able to say, um, you know, that I'm able, oh yeah, I got t- time with her the other day because you Snapchat. That's not time with a sister in Christ <laughs> to really search the scriptures or to bear your heart, but they really feel like it's an actual connection. And so it's substituting real deep walks with each other, I think, for just a superficial, just um, quick um, assessment of, of a relationship. And another thing I noticed too is when it comes to sin patterns, it does allow you to be able to uh, secretly hide sin quicker than if you weren't on social media or, or if you weren't using technology um, toward your benefit. And what I mean by that is many of the girls I counsel, I notice when it comes to pornography or it comes to um, looking at women and body image issues, they are yeah. like just like overwhelmed by social media and, and certain things that they wouldn't have saw um, any other way. And so, yeah, I just noticed that um, that those are the two things that technology, technology may be using for is detrimental. One other thought is, um, I think this is from... Um, Neil Postman's entertaining ourselves, amusing ourselves to death, amusing ourselves, amusing ourselves to death. But he talks about the value of um, action value. And so if I, one of the ways, at least I, for my own personal intake and my children's is if we're receiving news, like news used to be localized. And so so-and-so's house is on fire. You should go and help them put it out. Or the market's closed. There's no more eggs. Um, but now we're getting so much information with no action value. There's nothing we can do. And I think it increases anxiety and fear and depression. And so saying what, like asking myself and my children, what is the action value of that? Like, is there something that we can do about that? And if there is, let's do it. Let's pray. Let's stop. Let's send money. Let's write a letter. If there's not, then is this important? Do I need to be receiving this? Because we can be overwhelmed. We're not meant to process that much information, faces, images, pictures. Um, So saying, what's the action value of that for you? How does the watching The Bachelor really help you walk with, you know, or whatever it is? A great thing 
like practically for if um, college ministers here, if you guys do any like summer projects or any training environments, having sessions on appropriate uses of technology is instrumental. I feel like most, I, I don't know, I don't know if I can say most, many of the campus outreach regions at least have been incorporating into their um, trainings at different events, like elements of that. So it just seems like with the generation that, like of millennials and then the coming generation, that probably is going to become more and more essential. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've, I've been around college students long enough to really see the change that has happened in our society with technology. And campuses have changed too. I mean, when I was a college student, um, well, we did actually print our papers then. Um, but you still printed a hard copy and you had to go to the departmental office and turn it in. Um, And now you just email your papers in. And so professors have actually changed the way they run deadlines. I mean, papers are due at midnight on a Friday night. Well, our campus fellowship, where we want all of our students to come at 7.30 to gather and worship and be together, um, so often a student hasn't finished a paper. So they're back in their dorm room cranking it out because that deadline is midnight and they can email it in. Um, And so even something like that has changed the pace of life or the way of life uh, of doing ministry. Um, I will never forget, we have a dear professor um, who, he's a professor of German languages, He's a strong Christian. He plays worship music with us, and he loves to mentor students. And he does these uh, very fancy Titanic dinners in his home uh, for freshmen, where he recreates the meal, the last night of the meal of the Titanic. (laughs) I'm coming to his house. I know. I'll come to one of those. Students love this. (laughs) Um, And so it's this 10-course meal. It was actually 10 courses. Anyway, we drive the students to his home, and then we pick them up and drive them back. Well, I will never forget... Um, when s- iPhones were just beginning, I was just reminding Shar it was 2006, 2007, um, we, we went to pick up the students to take them back, and they didn't have their phones at the table, so pe- yeah. they were in their coat pockets or, or somewhere else. But the moment the dinner was over, they all reached for their devices and heads down looking at everything that they had missed. And I remember waiting to walk out, the group went with me, you know, out his door, down his stairs, and not one turned around to say, thank you, professor, for having us for this amazing meal. And it's because they were, you know, distracted. And I mean, that's not just them, that's all of us, right? Um, so we actually spend a lot of time um, teaching social interactions now um, that maybe have changed or have been lost because of what has happened with technology. So for example, in a Bible study, people are very, very slow to share their deep struggles with each other. Yet I scroll on Facebook and I see everything they've posted. I'm like, hello, you've just said it to everybody in the world, but you haven't said it face to face to these women who are committed to you weekly. Something's wrong here, what what can we do? Um, So again, many blessings that we see of technology, of course, but many challenges as well too. Um, I'm going to ask, for the sake of time, one, well, no, maybe two more questions to the panel, and then I'll turn it over to you all to ask your questions, okay? Um, switching gears about churches. We, are all, we all work for para-church organizations, um, but yet we're, we also believe in and are connected to our local churches. So um, this, I'll direct toward Corey, but again, everyone jump in. What, what do you do in your ministry to encourage students to be connected to the local church? How do you equip them to jump into a local church when they move on? Sorry, I'm going to let that ride. I'm not even going to look down. Um, yeah, that's a great question uh, because I actually didn't start with a um, parachurch ministry. I started um, by working as a campus minister. I was associate director at a local church for a campus ministry, and that's a totally different ball game. And why it's different is because we're under the authority of a local church already. And so we have elderships, and we have them we have them to have our authority. They actually give guidance to what's going on and wisdom and actually like commission us to do our job. So there was a bit of a difference in that and because it was tied to the local church, but it was at Michigan State, they also knew a culture was already built in to go to church on Sunday because this church that hosted their large group on Thursday night is now inviting you to Sunday. And so we were very active about making that connection. Now, being in parachurch ministry, I think what all parachurches should be doing is what the word actually means, right? So para means, it's a Greek word to mean alongside, and so alongside of what? The church. And so parachurch ministries are never to take the place of, but to actually work alongside 
alongside the church and help supplement or bring in the gospel to a particular context, i.e. college students. So it's contextualized in that sense. And so my campus ministry, what we try to do to make sure that they understand that this is a culture where you're to participate in our campus ministry, but you're also to be connected to a local church, is that we try to actually help them to get there. <laughs> so how, who are you riding with? How, what connections have you made? Another thing we used to do was with community groups out of a local church, we would make sure that they were partnered with um, a local, a host family, if you will. And so you had three college students from our organization they would then be in a life group or a community group at a local church. And so a family at that church knew our students and they were not isolated. It was intergener intergenerational, right? And they were always connected in that way. So I think those are ways that we kind of foster that connection. And um, Campus Arch is actually kind of a weird hybrid, so we are actually under the authority of a local church. I no, it's fine. Um, so it's a little bit easier, like Corey was saying, for us um, so we're, because we're under the authority of a local church, we're all members of the local church, um, they come with us mm -hmm. on Sundays um, most of the time. And then one of the things that we typically do is their senior year, just kind of like clutch and break, you kind of slowly let off, right? <laughs> we kind of slowly let off the discipleship and kind of slowly invite in more of the women in the local church to take that role. And um, it, there's a shift in initiation and pursuit that they are now initiating and pursuing. And we're still available, but they've got to learn to go to go get, um, rather than having it offered on a silver plate. Because what we don't want to do is create disillusionment in the local church. And there's, there's often a big gap. And then one of the things that we've had to do in San Diego, particularly because it takes so much longer for students to come to faith, we don't get to run the program the way we used to run the program because they're not coming to faith till their junior year. And we, then they're just still babies. And so we've helped create within local churches a program called Vision Pathways, which is just an extension of our college ministry, but they're connected with a career mentor and they're in small. So they're, it's very much a discipleship orienta orientation, but the table leaders are not on staff. They are church members. They're meeting with families. So they're actively engaged. So we're giving them baby steps um, and getting them plugged in to where we can pull out, and they're they're thriving in local communities. And it's been cool because the church has actually taken great, a lot of the smaller churches that we go to have taken great ownership, and they've been infused with the passion of discipleship because they're like, this is so cool. So it's a really sweet partnership of the intergenerational. So I think, yeah, we're just really big on college ministries come and go. Um, we do not want you to be those people who look back on college and say, oh, those were some great spiritual years for me, that the, your spiritual, best spiritual years are still ahead of you. Um, and the local church is, is Christ's bride, and that's the way you're going to get it. So, Yeah, we just really want students to have that intergenerational exposure. College is such a strange, bizarre time where you are on a campus with only people just like yourselves. Um, I know even on our campus, when students see somebody pushing a baby in a stroller across the campus, they're like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> or dogs. <laughs> um, so I think it's just crucial that we, you know, yes, fully uh, participate in our program, but also leave time to be involved at church. And um, college, uh, the curriculum does not include life skills. Um, they are spending hours and hours in classes pursuing wonderful academic things, but uh, they are not necessarily learning how to um, balance their budget or um, cook or care for different age people. So service opportunities at church are really important. Um, we urge students to work in the nursery or to help teach Sunday school or mentor in the youth group. Um, and we equip them, and then they are turning around and equipping others um, so that when they leave leave campus, they're ready to f take initiative. I mean, we're all there as staff pouring into them. And if they graduate and move somewhere and they're sitting there waiting for a church to come find them, that's not going to work. So they have to be equipped to, to reach in. Um, and so by encouraging them to do that with a church um, as they're in their student years, it really helps with the transition beyond college. Another quick practical that we did, that we always use Mark Dever, um, nine marks of a healthy church with our seniors, so that when they did get ready to go out into the world, they knew how to identify a healthy church. Because what you don't want is unnecessary frustration for your student when they leave, when they can see, oh, this church may not be the best because I have not seen the pastor open scripture one time. I'm seeing a lot of him, but I'm not seeing any of Jesus. And they're able to identify that, and they're able to see certain things that really were probably invisible to them, but were the structure that they were living in, and they just didn't know how to identify it. So nine marks um, 
I think Nine Marks of a Healthy Church is the name of the book by Mark Dever was what we used. Let's have some questions from all of you. We have more, so if you don't have any, I'll go back to our list, but I'm sure out here, let's ask some questions. I saw you in the back in the red. Could you stand and ask your question? Thanks. Okay, so Ashley lives in Cleveland, around seven to 10 universities, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, um, and she's wondering what her local church can do to partner with students to support them. Um, I, I'm assuming, students in your congregation? I think my initial thought is um, on the school websites a lot of times, the organizations that are Christian organizations that are recognized are listed there. And I would say get in touch, in touch with their staff because yeah. honestly, staff, we could always use more help. <laughs> we will take it if you offer it. So um, I would definitely say get in touch with some of the college ministries, inner varsity, um, crew, CEO, what are some, um, AIA, I don't know if there's Athletes in Action. Athletes in Action, those are some great ministries. Also, Navigators, Navigators is a great one. Stumo. Yeah, Stumo, great college ministries um, if they're on the campuses. It depends on the reason why. I see a lot of campus ministries having to leave public institutions because our faith has an exclusive call and apostatizing that people are to come. And because of these places are public, publicly funded and church and state are separate, a lot of, the, um, of campus ministries can lose their charters at universities. And so then you have to be a little bit more shrewd in how you approach the campus. I know of campus ministries who are not chaplain and actually work functionally on the campus by allowing the student groups to be the leader in who are actually recognized, and then they come alongside and help the students. So there are ways around it to be a little bit more shrewd to actually get the gospel on the campuses. And to be honest, I mean, I really think relational is the way to go. You can you can draw students, and sometimes events, macro events, fe fuel micro events, the relational stuff. So maybe, I mean, we don't do a lot of door-to-door -door, like tabling or things like that, but being on the campus and eating in the cafeteria, I mean, those are the most awkward first interactions on the earth. <laughs> Every time we have someone share a testimony, it starts with, well, I was sitting down at the, at the cafeteria and this awkward guy came up to me and I was like, why are you talking to me? That happens all the time. But I mean, there, is, there needs to be someone, a few people who go and start that rela relational, that kind of headway, um, making a beachhead there. So, um, and then once you have a few people, I think love those people well, disciple them well, feed them. They love food. Um, and babysitting, hook them up with babysitting. I mean, like, bring them into families. I think sponsorship programs like that are big, but you need to have relational context to be able to do those things. So I think having physical bodies, like our pastors at some of our churches actually come and hang out on the campus, which is so cool. And they're just there, you know? Um, so finding some people who are wanting to do that and just posting up for a couple hours and having conversations and then trusting God to give you a few relationships. Another practical, you can contact the Dean of Student Life on any campus, and you should be able to say, how can I help freshmen move in? So move in is really important. And what you get is not only the students, but you get their parents. And that's what you're really after, right? And so the parents can also understand that, oh, we're a local church. We want to help your student just to move in. Here's a water bottle or some Clorox wipes to help you with the dorm room. You know, things like that. Just basic ways to help us um, serve them. So when your that student does start coming to your church, they may be 10, 15 minutes away, the parent knows, oh, yeah, that was so-and-so who helped me move in. So it's practical. How about another question? Okay. okay, right here in the black and white. Great question. <laughs> I think it was like ways in evangelism of weeding through the misconceptions of that Christians might have within the community or the, our country. Yeah, it depends on who you're approaching. So everyone's a skeptic because of their own background, right? And so if I'm approaching evangelism and the woman is upset because of homosexuality and the church's stance on that, um, first and foremost, I usually lead with a posture of trying to hear and trying to understand and help me to understand exactly why are you concerned about this? Are you yourself same-sex attracted or are you more because you're advocating for a friend? And there, there's a difference there. Also, once you actually hear what they're saying, apologize for what the, when, they're, when you are able to. There are things the church, unfortunately, has done wrong. And being able to admit, I am so sorry that the church did not represent scripture like it should have been. And I think that gives you a lot of a social capital to be able to actually move in with the gospel. And so that's the way I approach it. I actually come more or less on defense of like, well, the church would never or God would never. It's like, God doesn't need to be defended. Like he's ultimate, right? He's eternal. So I'm, I don't need to defend him. I'm just trying to show you and reveal to you. And I think that posture and apologetics is a little bit different than just trying to cram down their throat. This is what it is. 
Um, I'll just throw out a couple ideas in case they help. Um, we're in a similar context to Providence, Rhode Island. Um, in fact, the ministry that I serve with uh, was founded in 1932, so over 80 years old. It's been the Princeton Evangelical Fellowship for all these years, and um, after much prayer and discussion with our board and alumni, um, we actually changed the name, and we are now the Princeton Christian Fellowship. And it's because in our context, uh, the word evangelical was just a huge stumbling block to too many of our students who wouldn't even come and listen or check it out um, because they assume what that word means by how it's used most frequently in the media. Um, so I get the context. Um, one of the things our students have been doing, this has been so successful, so I recommend it. Uh, they copied it from England, where there's something called text for toasties. And at Princeton, they call it Q for Q, questions for quesadillas. Mm -hmm. And they assemble as teams, and they break up into our dorms, and they, um, through GroupMe, through um, all sorts of social media, or even some posters, they say, Text us a question, any question you want about God, about faith, about the church, about Christianity. Text it to this number, and we will make you a quesadilla, and we will bring it to your room, deliver it, like, for free, free study break. Uh, they make quesadillas, they bring little salsa and sour cream on the side, um, and they go in pairs, and they answer the question. Questions for quesadillas. Actually, we partner with all the groups on campus. Everybody comes together to do this. And they do it from 10 p.m. to midnight, and they actually do it the first weekend before midterm exams because students are in their rooms and they are studying. And they're often looking for a study break to procrastinate. And you know, you might think that you get um, really like provocative, annoying, you know, questions just meant to push you. And there are some of those. But honestly, what we have discovered is that people really want to talk about these things and they just don't know how. And so our students go door to door with these quesadillas and they're answering things like, um, well, how, how can there be a God when there's evil and suffering? Mm -hmm. um, what is, how, how do we respond to Christianity and gender? You know, all sorts of questions. You name it, it's asked. Some of these, that's it. It's a one time answer the question. They never see each other again. But so many of the times it leads to further dinners, further conversations, friendships are born. So the last time we did this, um, there were 210 questions. So, and this is a campus of 5,000 students. This is not a big campus. So, anyway, throw that out there in case. It might open some doors. Okay, more, oh my goodness, so many great questions. Um, in the blue right here? I think the feminism question, I tried to get um, further above the waterline on that one, like further upstream. Um, and I try to bring it back to the Trinity and Philippians 2. And so, kind of that, that sense of entitlement. I think there's... I, what can we accept? What do we reject? What can we redeem is a good way to look at things that are happening in the culture, accept, reject, redeem. And so what, are the, what is right about feminism? So starting with what is good? What, what at the heart, what was, what was what, his, you could look at it historically, you could look at it um, socially, culturally, because most people aren't talking about historical feminism. They're talking about the cultural kind of angsty, I don't know what you would call it. So, but I think giving them a, a, a historical, let's trace what was feminism. Where did it come from? What were its roots? Because they're completely unmoored. They're not moored to history in any way. And so there's no concept of, well, okay, that was initially for women's rights. or So we're, we're yes for that. But I think the question, the spirit of entitlement mm -hmm. is antithetical to the gospel. And, and so like I'll, that's a hill we'll die on in discipleship because Christ being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or utilized, but laid himself down. And we get to be Jesus. That's a privilege. And so going back to the Trinity, um, I think is really significant, um, anchoring it in something that eternal um, as, as a starting point. But I think starting to diffuse it because it's a complex thing. When, when you say feminism, what are you seeing in them? Where is it coming from? What are they, are they advocating for rights? What are they advocating for? And what, um, who is it that um, in the Old Testament said, said to Abram when he was lying about Sarah, what has been done to you? That was the question he asked when he realized he had been lying about his wife. 
What has been done to you? And I think that was a very insightful question of the king. Where is this coming from is significant. Because if it's coming from a place of abuse, that's one track. If it's coming from a place of, I just want my voice to be heard and I want to be loud, that's another track. So I think understanding where this is coming from, what are the streams of influence, what are the heart things that are being tugged on is, is very significant and, and channels the way you direct it. Let's mention a few resources quickly. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm kind of like you. I've mostly used the Bible, and the resource I would say is one-to-one Bible reading. I think it's actually in the bookstore. Very simple um, method of just, it's similar to OIA, but I would say maybe, or the inductive Bible study method, a little more simplistic, but helping students to learn how to study God's Word. That's a great resource. Um, but that's really, I feel like that might be the only one I've really used. I think you can use Desiring God kind of like as a uh, catalog, because if you look on Desiring God website, it has topics. So say I do want to go and only use scripture, I can look look at Desiring God blogs and I can see um, church. And then under church, it has church discipline, church um, church purpose, church whatever. And they're like, okay, church purpose. Then it's like, okay, now what scriptures can I look up? So now it gives me an idea or some type of verbiage that when I'm speaking with her, it can readily come to mind. But I honestly want her to trust God's word. So I probably hide those resources or don't push them as, as readily. For apologetics, uh, Tim Keller, Reason for God or Making Sense of God. Um, anything on the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries website, great articles linked there. Um, the, there's a, in our bookstore, I'm trying to think of things that I know are in the bookstore. Um, the Good Book Company does a series um, of Bible studies of, on books, like Romans for You, Judges for You. They're wonderful little lay commentaries, and then they have Bible study books as well. Those are really great if you're doing one-on-one yeah. Bible study and you want a tool. John Nielsen has a book out as... Um, the, the devotional narrative of scripture, something like that. But it's for students specifically. It's like aimed toward students. So I think that has been helpful for some people. And um, the J.I. Packer Knowing the Bible, is Knowing the Bible series the little ones? Or is it Knowing? Yeah. Yeah, it's a J.I. Packer Knowing the Bible series are small and very accessible. They're set into 12 set units. Um, very, they're, they have good theological insight, but they're not overwhelming it feels very accessible. So I feel like they're solid but accessible. So J.I. Packer Knowing the Bible series. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Gospel Coalition podcast. Check out more gospel-centered resources at thegospelcoalition.org.